Hold your horses, kids. This is not Palmer's picks. Tom Palmer Jr. has two articles. Count them two. Making articles up for in, in lost time. That's for sure. The Creator's Edge Tundra. So Tundra is Kevin Eastman's publishing company. I mentioned more creator rights uh, concerns. That is basically what this article is about. You know, this is a a new company. It doesn't last very long. Kind of shines somewhat brightly for a little bit. But he talks about what he's trying to do, and that is to put more control into the creator's hands. Not just in terms of creator's rights, but also things like budget, um, having giving the creator input in what kind of book they want format-wise. You know, he publishes a lot of independent stuff in color, which was somewhat unheard of at the time. You think about, if you think about it, just what you're describing is, you're describing like the Fantagraphics of a decade later, you know what I mean? Fanta is still just publishing like pamphlet and magazine format, and those are like the choices that you have. And he had like way better production values and stuff. He might have even had some of the first like chromium covers and junk like that. Yeah, and so th this article basically runs through what they're publishing, what they've published, what their publishing plans are. It's names, report, yeah, it's reportage. Yeah, it names a lot of artists and a lot of books. And so I brought some, and I figured the best way to, to kind of touch on this is to just look at some of these books. Yeah, bust them out, man. Uh, one, one of the things he was talking about when the the uh, when Tom is asking about like you know what, how are how are you what kind of trust do you put in your creators to deliver? Um, they state that uh, three issues have to be completed before they'll they'll start publishing, which I think that's basically standard protocol for like image comics and, and places like that uh, to, to today, you know, they've been burned enough. But obviously if you have like a Dave McKean doing cages or, or, or something like that, like it's going to take a lot longer. Um, you'll, you'll get what you get kind of. All read uh, Madman. Yep. I didn't realize they published some color Madman too. Um, these are the ones with the little two color and then, the animated corner bits of Madman dancing, so kind of a fun <laughs> flourish. So Mike Allred, obviously, I think everybody knows him. Big, huge career. Uh, Tundra picked up the the last, the conclusion of the Crow. So Tundra published the conclusion, the concluding volume of James O'Barr's Crow. I think they reprinted the first four issues too, in two like square bound deluxe editions. Um, it's just amazing that this took so so long for the for the finale uh, to come out, man. But uh, you know, this is where this is where the poetic justice takes place. This was a huge book for me, especially because it would mix so many different styles. You know, you'd have washes and zipatones and duo print, and it, it was just a totally. I hadn't seen anything like this. Very very big. Jim Woodring. Jim Woodring in color. Oh, that's so good, man. You know, Woodring, he, he worked in animation a lot, like in the early 80s. He he worked at, um, he worked at, uh, was it Rankin, ba no, not Rankin Bass. What's the, what's the other? Ruby Spears. He worked at Ruby Spears with with Jack Kirby on uh, such such uh, animated classics as Turbo Teen, the one with the boy who turns into the Corvette. <laughs> <laughs> the color in this is, is pretty remarkable. Incredible. Pittsburgh Zone. Wayno. One Wayno. Man Anthology. Um, very popular with alternative cartoonists at the time. I don't know if this stuff, some of it may have appeared other places, but often cartoonists were doing contributing to anthologies and then printing several stories uh, whenever they would do their own. I think it's in, uh, is, do you, is that Beer Nuts 3? Yes. Uh, Dan Klaus says that there's like a there's a superhero story in, in this issue that he cites as like one of the, the great comic strips of... Uh, of all time. It may or may not be in that one. But Wayno, he uh, he draws the uh, the Bizarro comic strip uh, nowadays. Dan Perraro's old strip. I guess it's not that one. One of the artists that he mentions in the list is Al Columbia. Um, this is, I think, his first single comic, like uh, first complete comic that he did. Al Columbia would go on. He's done several works with Fanagraphics. He kind of has a horror cartoony style. He's, he's moved more in a direction that's influenced by, say, 20s animation, 30s animation. But uh, at this time, very much like that alternative horror kind of style. What's the uh, what's the Big Numbers story? Was it Big Numbers? Yeah, he worked for... Um, 
I have a copy of that. Big Numbers is listed in this article. So Big Numbers, Alan Moore's uh, pet project, published under Mad Love, but I think Tundra distributed it or co-published it or something. And Al Columbia worked as Bill Sienkiewicz's assistant on the first two issues of this book. And then Bill Sienkiewicz left the book and Al Columbia drew issue three and then something went wrong. And I think he tore up the issue or, or something famously. It exists. We'll probably have a link to that because I believe issue three or at least some of issue three's artwork is online and you can see it. But pretty heady stuff. Like this is this is a fun, interesting comic. Yeah. And speaking of links, uh, don't forget the links in the description below the video because I... Uh, Every episode we have is chock full of stuff, and we also include um, more in-depth uh, analysis from Tom Palmer Jr. on the columns that he writes. Um, These are really, you know, this is a pretty exciting publisher for the time. Now this is what comics look like. You know, it, it'd be much, you could find publishers that are comparable in many ways. As you said, Fanographics, you know, sort of looks like this nowadays. Yeah. But back then, it just didn't really exist. So we had a really fun conversation <laughs> about these two books uh, recently. I don't know if you remember this, Ed. I do. We were, we were trying to describe, we were talking about white trash and trailer trash. We were convinced they were both, we were both right. We were convinced they were both published by Tundra, and it just did not make sense what we were describing. Right. Well, it turns out we were both right. Um, how crazy is it that Tundra produced two comic books maybe, called White Trash and Trailer Trash? Yeah, maybe they put out 30 different titles <laughs> and two of them are, uh, you know, and this is rednecks. <laughs> this is in the vein in some ways as uh, Beer Nuts. You know, it's a alt comics, black and white. Roy Tompkins? Yeah. He's still around, man. He's post art a lot here and there. White Trash is a painted comic. And I don't know this. This is um, Martin Emmon. This Gordon Rennie guy? Mm -hmm. He did the Simon Bisley interview from, from issue uh, three of Wizard Magazine. That makes sense. Uh, Martin Emmon? I, I don't know if that's the right pronunciation. He did some Lobo stuff after Bisley left. I mean, this is clearly one of those Bisley clones that Biz was talking about. That's what I thought. He... Uh, he doesn't have a large body of work. He actually uh, hung himself at a very young age. Oh, that so. sucks. This, I mean, this stuff looks great. Yeah, I think his art's really attractive. Um, so this is a four-issue series that's been collected. But uh, I also brought this along to some proof of him drawing Lobo. Uh, <laughs> Lobo Cop, I should say. And you can see he's doing more of the pen and ink style, you know, the black and white line work. Uh, I love these British guys with with their like crazy pen and ink, man. Like I just uh, borrowed all those Deadline magazines off of you, man, and, and uh, those things are blowing my mind. They're easily like so much and quickly like putting an influence on on my style and my sketchbooks and junk. Look at that, man! It's everything you want in the <laughs> That's comic. That's it. Now you don't have to go out and buy Lobo Cop because you can just pause the frame here. <laughs> yeah, make that your uh, iPhone background or whatever. They also published, of course, alt superhero comics, which, uh, you know, there's kind of a subgenre of this stuff. Superheroes are so dominant, of course, that it's hard to avoid. Um, these are Rick Veach's King Hell series. Uh, I think they were co-published with Tundra. I don't see a Tundra label on here, but it's listed in the article. And these are Brad Pack's about sidekicks in a very fallen world. This changed the way I read comics. Like, I couldn't go back to Marvel and DC after reading <laughs> superheroes that, that sort of had, lived these lives. But I love the, you know, I love how they look, like inventive layouts. It also opened my eyes that indie comic didn't mean bad artist. Right. You know, Rick Veach is as good as any superhero artist you're going to come across. Really cool rendering and values. I, I put him, I put him comfortably in my top 10. He's, he's, in, he's in my top 10 cartoonist, man. Max Immortal is kind of a take on the archetypal superhero, Superman, of course. Um, in this one, the, the alien that falls to the earth is not quite as as peaceful as Superman. <laughs> and uh, the poor farmers that find him pay quite quite a uh, cost. <laughs> then He's also that, that, I think we've talked about the um, children that don't look right in comics and, and how that can be really <laughs> freaky. It's almost like he figured that out. But uh, here he is assaulting what would have been 
you know, equivalent of Paw Kent. Yeah, and then, and then there's throughout the the series or whatever, there's allusions to you know Siegel and Schuster and you know the work for hire thing. You know, Tundra once again is Kevin Eastman's company, and he commissioned Rick Veach to do several issues of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles too. Yeah. So like they had this relationship for for years. So they mentioned publishing the Jam. And I was like, I like the jam. This is another one of the alternative superheroes. This one's really fun. You know, like he shows up, he eats sandwiches on his stakeouts and stuff. You know, it was a very human kind of uh, down to earth character, even though he had his homemade sweat sweatsuit costume and everything. I was like, I have I have the jam. I'll pull out a Tundra issue of the jam. So this one is not Tundra. It's Kamiko. <laughs> I see where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> this one is also not Tundra. This is Matrix graphics series. Also not Tundra. This one is Slave Labor. <laughs> here's one from Dark Horse. And here's Caliber. I have lots of jam, but none from Tundra. And this speaks to the promise of Tundra. What it should have been, would have been, could have been, but didn't become. So many announcements for very cool comics were, were sort of in the pipeline. You will flip the page and we will see evidence of uh, some of these forthcoming comics that never uh, were were published by uh, by Tundra. Tundra folded quite quite rapidly uh, after this point. They are they were already on shaky ground, and uh, there will be more Tundra stuff in future issues. But uh, you know, they do get absorbed in a way by a uh, kitchen sink. It's a very legendary company. Kevin Eastman spent a lot of money on this company and produced some very interesting comics. But it's legendary because there's so little money in comics traditionally. So whenever somebody showed up with some money. It was real different for a couple of years, and there's some great writing about Tundra that has come out of it. There's a there's a great Kevin Eastman interview in the Comics Journal where they kind of break this down. It's amazing. We're gonna have to unpack that one on on yes. Kayfabe, man. Yes. Like like if we don't do the whole issue, it's a 50 page interview with Gary Groth and Kevin Eastman talking about spending 11 million. Like Gary Groth is like. You spent $11 million on what? I've been a publisher for 25 years. And I think cumulatively in my 25 year career, I don't think I hit $11 million. Yeah, it's, it's he incredible. Made, he made the mistake of giving uh, giving guys advances. Can't do that. Before <laughs> receiving any page. Like, like when you hear that term advance to break kayfabe, when you hear that term advance, what it typically would be is um, you get half the money up front and then they kind of hold the rest for you for when you finish the project. Uh, you can expect to receive that money. Just turn in the damn book. These guys would catch an advance and go hop an airplane, man. Go hop the, <laughs> go hop the PJ. Go hop the PJ and go cross country, which I, I want to just point out since we turned the page right here. Okay, so first off, this Captain Stern um, did not come out by, by Tundra. I don't think. It, it, I, I have the kitchen sink version of that. Put it that way. And this image right here, man, Simon Bisley painting a Michael T. Gilbert fucking Mr. Monster. This right here would be pornography to Glenn Danzig because Gilbert drew a um, a Sam Hain comic. And I understand that the the uh, the holiday is really called Saw Wayne, but I'm not a douchebag. Uh, he, he drew a Sam Hain comic and uh, Bisley worked with Danzig a whole lot, man, did a couple Danzig album covers, man, a lot of Verotic comics. So like, you know, Dan you know, Glenn was checking this out and was just like, <laughs> <laughs> so it was a young Jim rug. Yeah. <laughs> this is comics porn for quite a few of us. Uh, one last Tundra book I I'd like to just flip through is Dave McKean's cages. This is probably one of the more lauded books that came out of Tundra. Um, I got hold of one of these at a very young age, uh, I happened to find one at a flea market for a quarter or something. I would have never bought. I think these are like $4 books. I would have never bought this book on my for a regular price. But talk about a comic that I had never seen anything that looked like this stuff. You know, I was totally Marvel and DC and buying off the newsstand and whatever I could find. So coming across this in a flea market really kind of opened my eyes. This was one of those comics that I could actually show my... Uh, art teacher and she didn't scoff at which was unusual um, the other one was uh, Steve Bissett's Tyrant which is a very well drawn you know story about dinosaur history and that was one that she sort of gave her her uh, grudging approval to visually but this one was really like I would I would read every comic I got whenever I was a kid because I didn't have very many comics and trying to like 
sort this out. This is this guy who's a mover, but he's a very small old man. And he's carrying these heavy boxes up the stairs. Just bizarre. You know, in the context of like, I have Spider-Man and Batman are sort of my two edges of what I know about comics. This thing just left me scratching my head, but also coming back to it and revisiting it. If the Fabers heard some rustling about while, while Jim was speaking, I was take, I was looking around and I couldn't find my copy of, of Skin by Peter Milligan and, and Brendan McCarthy because those two guys had this complete like finished, you know, 45 page, 60 page, whatever, whatever it was, a uh, book that um, they couldn't find a damn publisher for it. I think they went through three possibilities, you know, uh, ver um, uh, Fleetway, um, Quality, and maybe even uh, Vertigo. Like, was Vertigo around at this point? Maybe not. Probably. A, yeah, I think it was. Um, but Kevin Eastman was the guy who had like the courage to, uh, to publish that piece. I was looking for my copy, couldn't find it. What's that book about, Ed? <laughs> I, I believe there will be a picture up to just show the cover of, <laughs> uh, of the book, but it's like a little uh, skinhead guy with, um, he, he was one of the thalidomide uh, children. Yeah, I remember that book. I think it was would get banned or censored, and you know, it was a very controversial book. Well, uh, I th correct me if I'm mistaken too. Um, did Kevin Eastman help with the costs of uh, Taboo? You you mentioned Steve Bissett earlier, but like, uh, did he help facilitate Taboo? I think they were linked, but I'm not sure to what extent because again, Tundra sort of did not last very long. So I think there were definitely connections. It might have been From Hell that was specifically connected to Tundra briefly. Tundra may have even done a collection or two of From Hell. So they were linked. You know, the way that um, Rick Veach did work with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I think Steve Bissett was near Northampton, which is where like Eastman was based at the time. So I think all of those guys were connected. They all did stuff on creator ownership, too. Mm -hmm. They wrote the crea the comics creator's Bill of Rights together. You know, there were probably, gosh, I can't remember who all was part of that group, but I believe Kevin Eastman and Steve Bissett were both part of a very small group that did that in the 80s. And, you know, once you get into creator rights, that's kind of a big, a big piece of comics history where a bunch of successful creators were talking about these issues, um, you know, long before Image and in very... Uh, very black and white ways, you know, writing about how do you treat people in an anthology? What are, you know, what's the standard of what people own in these kinds of projects and exchanges and stuff. So they were connected. I'm not sure if they actually published an issue or two, if they distributed some or what the connection was, but there, there was definitely a connection of some sort. Before we split from this article, uh, looking back on things, Tom Palmer suggests that maybe Maybe the the sort of downfall of Tundra was that um, that they just couldn't they just couldn't find an identity as a publishing house, and we just showed a chaotic mix of comics, and 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 I would say that like that 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 is the identity in a way, you know what I mean? Like publishers now like do publish very wide and varied things, kind of like this, but at the time they didn't, and perhaps. Tundra suffered for it. Perhaps they also suffered for the the, the, the company name. They also, um, it notes that shortly before this article, Eastman had purchased Heavy Metal Magazine. So it may have suffered from just too much happening. There, You know, we talked about the Comics Journal interview, and I think in that interview, Eastman tells a story about going to San Diego Comic-Con, and like he had a business manager or partner, somebody that was helping, you know, direct what he was doing. And he was supposed to maybe get like three series and came back with like 60, you know, so like it was just too much, yeah. you know, add heavy metal in, add trying to keep the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know, signing checks from that. Like it's a lot of stuff happening and it may have just been too much. I'm glad you brought up the heavy metal thing because I, I did. I have that note here, um, but I because I didn't realize that he bought that magazine so early. 